Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our discussion on uh, alternate fuels for internal combustion engines as well as gas turbines. So in the last class, we were talking about different sources of biomass and different fuels that can be created. And we sort of said that we are looking essentially for uh, liquid fuels, right? And uh, when you look at the biofuel market, uh, it's dominated by ethanol, uh, what is this huge amount right here, and uh, biodiesel, what is the second most common um, biofuel. So we'll focus on these two, and then we'll talk about uh, hydrogen as an alternate uh, fuel for decreasing the carbon footprint of different uh, power generation as well as uh, uh, transportation applications. So let's start with ethanol. When you talk about ethanol, uh, ethanol or uh, ethyl alcohol, which, uh, whose chemical formula is C2H5OH, uh, it's one of the most uh, common biofuels, one of the most mature biofuels that has been used for a very long time. It's uh, primarily made from the starch that you get from corn grain, but this is not the only source for ethanol. Uh, you can make uh, uh, ethanol from various uh, other um, grains as well, or various other uh, biomass materials. So you could make it from corn, from sugar beets, sugar cane, or even cellulose, right? Now, uh, it depends on the country what the major source of uh, ethanol is. For example, in the US, corn is a major source because they have a lot of excess corn. But in Brazil, sugar beets are the main source for producing ethanol. Now, uh, the key point we want is uh, no matter what feedstock you take, uh, we want to ensure that the feedstock has um, high sugar content. And this is uh, simply because uh, some feedstock with high sugar content will uh, yield a much higher amount of uh, ethanol for the same uh, initial mass of, uh, of the feedstock that you're taking. So you just want it to work out economically as well. Now, when we look at uh, the overall process, what happens is that you take your feedstock, whatever it is, whether it's corn or sugar cane or sugar beets, right? And uh, uh, this this feedstock is converted to sugar or glucose, basically. And once you convert that into sugar, then the, the sugar itself or the glucose, it's then fermented into ethanol uh, through this chemical reaction, okay? So you can see that one mole of uh, glucose is producing two moles of ethanol plus a certain amount of CO2. Okay, now uh, you can say that in this process we are sort of shifting the uh, the emission of CO2 from uh, a part of the emission of the CO2 from the vehicle to uh, the production process itself. But the reason ethanol uh, is has found favor is simply because uh, ethanol is coming from these bio sources and these sources. Well, the reason they have carbon in there is because they captured it from the atmosphere. So it's some sort of a circle that it's um, uh, it's, it's following for the CO2 at least, right? Uh, and uh, so, yeah, this is the overall process. Okay, so obviously if you want uh, to produce more ethanol, you want more glucose uh, per unit mass. And so you want to have something that's high in sugar content. Now, when you, uh, if you're looking at, um, you know, growing sugar cane or sugar beets or corn just for the pr purpose of producing ethanol, then the energy that is going to be consumed in the entire process, you know, the, uh, f starting from the scratch, from plowing, uh, planting, harvesting, fermenting, and eventual delivery to the customer, the amount of energy involved is, is pretty high. And uh, it can be very much comparable to the energy content of ethanol itself, right? And the energy content of ethanol is not too high, right? It's, it's uh, significantly smaller as uh, compared to gasoline, as we'll see in a minute. So uh, it makes sense to sort of use excess uh, corn or excess uh, sugar beets or sugar cane or whatever to convert that into ethanol. Or essentially, um, it makes economic sense when you're doing it in some sort of a waste to energy conversion, right? Or excess uh, excess uh, crop to energy conversion, right? Uh, but it it doesn't really uh, makes economic sense to just grow crops for the purpose of doing this, uh, unless uh, it's subsidized by the government. Okay. Now, when you look at the heating value for ethanol, it's, it's rather small. Uh, the high heating value is 29,710, but we, uh, are, we make use of the lower heating value for uh, applications where the water uh, in the combustion process comes out as the vapor. So uh, engines, gas turbines, this is where what we are sort of making use of. So the lower heating value, you can say it's about 27,000, right? Uh, 26,950 uh, to be precise. If you compare it with gasoline, gasoline has a much, much higher heating value, right? So lower heating value of 43,000. So 
you could say it's almost half uh, uh, the ethanol is almost half the heating value for gasoline, which means that for the same fuel tank, you will be able to travel a smaller distance, right? Or if you want to keep your mileage, uh, then you'll need to increase the size of the uh, of the fuel tank, which is going to encroach on the space you have available in the trunks or the storage space in your car. So those are compromises, uh, and uh, that's something to uh, be aware of. Now, further talking about uh, ethanol has some advantages, right? So when we look at any fuel, so let's say gasoline, uh, gasoline tends to have some amount of sulfur, and this basically comes from the the oil well itself, right? It's uh, a lot of sulfur is removed, but still, uh, based on current emission uh, regulations, there is still some amount of sulfur that's going to be there in the in the gasoline, and so it's going to form some small amounts of sulfur oxides, right? As uh, it undergoes the as the fuel undergoes combustion within the engine or in the gas turbine, uh, right? So um, that's that's sort of uh, one issue uh, with uh, conventional fuels. But when you talk about ethanol, ethanol is uh, C2H5OH. Right, it also has an oxygen molecule in here, which uh, helps basically ensuring that uh, uh, the combustion process is more complete, or there is no, uh, there is less amount of unburned uh, hydrocarbon emissions. Right, so that's uh, that's an advantage with uh, with ethanol. So you don't have any sulfur emissions, of course, and you also tend to have less of unburned hydrocarbons. And it's a good renewable replacement for gasoline, where you can make use of the same engine with uh, small changes in the fuel supply line. Uh, uh, so essentially the same engine, uh, but uh, with uh, with a fuel which is which has a lower carbon footprint uh, over its life cycle. Now, uh, another advantage uh, for uh, ethanol is that when you add ethanol to gasoline, well, uh, ethanol is less reactive than uh, gasoline. Uh, it has this uh, OH bond which makes it less reactive. Okay, uh, and since it's less reactive than gasoline, it means that its octane number is higher. Right, its octane number is actually higher than hundred. So adding uh, ethanol to gasoline helps uh, increasing the octane number, which basically means that uh, it's another way of uh, making fuels high octane number, which can be used for higher compression ratio engines. And basically, as we have uh, studied in the uh, in previous classes, if you improve the compression ratio for an uh, internal combustion engine, you're increasing its efficiency. Now, this all of this is by design, right? You you uh, set, your engine will suddenly not start operating better just because you've added ethanol to it. It's just that uh, by design, if your engine has a high compression ratio, which means that it requires high octane fuel, uh, then ethanol helps us obtain that high octane fuel. It's one more way of obtaining that high octane fuel, right? So that's that's like a win-win situation. Now, when we talk about ethanol, ethanol tends to be blended with gasoline in different um, uh, concentrations. Uh, uh, the two main concentrations, uh, let's say, available in the U.S. are gasohol and E85. You have similar or um, uh, different concentrations in different countries around the globe. Uh, India has something similar as uh, gasohol, right? But E85 is probably unique to the U.S. So when we talk about gasohol, it's simply a mixture of gasoline and ethanol with 10% uh, ethanol content in it, right? And E85 essentially is 85% ethanol, right? Uh, e standing for ethanol in here. Now, the reason we, we don't make it 100% ethanol is uh, simply to avoid uh, uh, operating issues with the engine, right? So 15% ga uh, gasoline within the uh, ethylene gasoline, uh, ethanol gasoline mixture is just to uh, uh, avoid uh, major changes to the engine operation and to ensure uh, um, a Avoid basically op operating issues uh, when you op uh, when you uh, burn pure ethanol, for example. Now, uh, when we talk about the rest uh, uh, gasoline ethanol mixture, well, well it's it's usually ten percent ethanol, but it can range from five to ten percent, right? And uh, globally, um, countries with a lot of biomass are uh, trying to increase the amount of ethanol within their um, within the gasoline alcohol, uh, ethanol mixture and. Uh, so when you go higher than 10, usually it requires uh, changing the fuel supply lines, right? And uh, so uh, there are majority of the countries are sort of using some amount of ethanol within uh, the gasoline uh, uh, mixture. Uh, but there are some countries like Brazil, which are using almost close to pure ethanol, right? They're operating with 93% ethanol. So of course, 93% ethanol uh, is higher than 85%, which means that uh, uh, they have a lot of vehicles which are able to operate uh, with that. And again, it's not a technical issue. It's something that can be done. You just need different components. You have to make the appropriate uh, 
changes to your engine to your fuel supply line to make it work uh, uh, perfectly without any issues. So okay, that's about for ethanol. It's a good fuel. It's an interesting fuel. It has some uh, advantages uh, in terms of uh, no uh, sulfur oxide emissions and others, but it also has challenges in terms of uh, the fact that um, uh, it's uh, there is a lot of energy spent in in processing this entire fuel, right? And uh, waste to fuel makes more sense than uh, growing a crop to make ethanol. And also, uh, it competes sometimes with food. If you're looking at corn or sugar beets, uh, these are food sources, right? So uh, you don't want uh, farmers to pick between providing corn to the market or converting it to, to ethanol. So there are some issues with it, but overall it's uh, it's um, a pretty nice fuel and it's uh, used as growing. And uh, the, the, the move forward is basically to uh, increase the amount of sources that can provide you ethanol economically. Uh, one other option is essentially to uh, take hydrogen uh, or uh, uh, create hydrogen as we'll discuss uh, using renewable energy and then combine that with CO2 to form uh, methanol or ethanol, right? Uh, so methanol is CH3OH, ethanol is C2H5OH. So there are various sources through which you can make ethanol, can be completely renewable just through using solar PV and carbon capture. Uh, of course, the costs are higher, but uh, the idea is just to say that, okay, ethanol is a good fuel, we understand how it works, and uh, there are other ways to make it, uh, uh, to produce the amount of ethanol needed. Uh, it does not necessarily have to compete with food, okay? So that's about for ethanol. Now, when we move to biodiesel, uh, biodiesel is another very interesting fuel. Uh, of course, uh, ethanol is an alternate for gasoline, so it's used in uh, spark ignition engines. But when we talk about biodiesel, it's an alternate for diesel, right, or alternate for fossil diesel. So it's going to be used in compression ignition engines, which is a different class of engines. Now, uh, biodiesel is, uh, is basically ethyl or methyl yeast the esters, right, uh, a mixture of these uh, esters, and it's produced mainly uh, through a chemical process where you uh, take organically derived oils uh, from various sources and you combine them with ethanol or methanol, right, uh, uh, in presence of a catalyst just to make it happen quicker. Now, uh, what are the different sources for biodiesel? Well, we can get it from many sources, vegetable oils, animal fats, recycled restaurant greases, um, recycled uh, uh, oils from restaurants, for example, and uh, that uh, that uh, uh, would be a better choice than sort of uh, competing again with with food so used vegetable oils are are better but these are the different sources from which we can get right uh, so biodiesel is something that can be very uh, very easily created there are a lot of youtube videos where you can see people using uh, uh, used vegetable oil uh, or recycle recycling the vegetable oil and converting that into biodiesel now the heating value for biodiesel is really good, uh, much much better than uh, let's say ethanol. Uh, so it's about the high heating value is about forty thousand seven hundred kilojoule per kilogram, which compares favorably with uh, fossil diesel or petroleum diesel, which is uh, which has a high heating value of forty four thousand eight hundred. So it's just about ten percent less. Not not too bad, right? Not half the value like we had for ethanol. Now. Uh, uh, in terms of bio, biodiesel, it can be used in compression ignition engines uh, as a single fuel itself or it can be used as a blend, right? It can be mixed with conventional diesel fuel or fossil diesel fuel. Uh, when you talk about the common biodiesel mixtures, um, they're, uh, they're basically, uh, the common one is either B20, where you have 20% biodiesel and 80% conventional diesel, or you could also go with 100% uh, biodiesel, which is called as uh, B100, okay? Now, if you want to use uh, B20, then you don't really have to make any modifications. The existing engines, existing, uh, fuel supply lines will, will do the job. But if you want to make use of B100, use 100% uh, uh, biodiesel, then you, you will have to change the hoses and the gaskets simply because these uh, biodiesels and ethanols and all of these biofuels, they tend to be, uh, th these are all oxygenated fuels, right? Uh, so they contain some amount of oxygen in there and they tend to react with uh, the, the rubber hoses and, um, and e eat them away. So you want to be uh, uh, you want to ensure that your fuel supply lines are secure and it just requires new materials that's it right a different set of materials than what would work with uh, with fossil diesel uh, now uh, yeah one one minor challenge is that it has slightly lower heating values than fossil diesel so it's going to give you probably less power and less mileage but uh, the key point is that um, it uh, it reduces unburnt hydrocarbons which is a big deal right uh, uh, there's no sulfur in there uh, because 
sulfur comes from the crude oil source and if you don't have if you're not creating the fuel from crude oil uh, from an oil well then there is no reason for sulfur to be there right so zero sulfur and um, less CO emissions less unburnt hydrocarbons simply because uh, you have some amount of oxygen within the fuel itself and that um, helps with uh, taking the uh, combustion to uh, it's more completion now the challenge is that as uh, as you have uh, less co and uh, less unburnt hydrocarbons basically you're moving towards uh, more complete combustion which means higher temperatures and higher temperatures usually means higher NOx emissions right so this is uh, one this is not really a challenge you uh, it, it is uh, it is a side effect right so any engine where you try to maximize um, uh, uh, minimize the unburned hydrocarbons, you'll end up with higher temperature and higher NOx emissions, whether you use biodiesel or not, right? So this is just a side effect of the, of the way the engines operate. Uh, low temperature means uh, more soot or more black carbon, uh, uh, more of the uh, uh, carbon black, sorry, and uh, high temperature, which avoids all of the soot and others, uh, or unburned hydrocarbons means more NOx. Right, so this is just a, a part and parcel of the game. So uh, I, I wouldn't call it a deal breaker. So it's it's a nice uh, way to uh, again uh, convert waste cooking oil into something uh, usable, right? And uh, instead of just dumping it uh, into uh, I don't know uh, uh, into the um, uh, into the bin, it makes uh, if possible it makes sense to sort of convert that into biodiesel and uh, make use of it. So it's another um, uh, useful fuel that's available from biomass. OK, so uh, we will solve a couple of problems uh, later uh, in the class. Uh, right? So there are three problems that I want to solve just to give you a good flavor about uh, how do you build, how do you create, how do you produce these biofuels? What quantities are we talking about and uh, how would you use them in engines, right? So the first one is about engines. Second uh, one is about, uh, uh, we have two problems, one on uh, ethanol production, another on ethanol utilization. And third one is about municipal solid waste, which is another way uh, you can basically do uh, waste to energy, right? And we'll look at uh, uh, the economics of it uh, briefly, okay? Now, uh, moving on, let's go and talk about hydrogen. Now, uh, in the overall scheme of things, well, uh, fossil fuels are the dominant energy source, but uh, we want to move away from them because of uh, multiple reasons, uh, both global warming and um, the fact that they are non-renewable, right? So we need to have some sort of a fuel source which we can continue to use for hundreds, thousands of years, okay? And uh, biofuel is one option, which we have already discussed briefly. Another uh, option is hydrogen, basically, right? And uh, uh, or hydrogen and hydrogen associated fuels or, uh, like ammonia and uh, ethanol, methanol and all of these e-fuels that again can be created, synthetic fuels that can be created from hydrogen. Now, when we talk about hydrogen, uh, globally, uh, the way the hydrogen is produced is mainly through uh, uh, reforming, right? Reforming of fuel. It can be methane reforming uh, an SMR process, can be oil reforming, uh, which accounts for 29%. Uh, or it could be uh, uh, gasification or water electrolysis. But when you look at gasification and water electrolysis, put together, they contribute uh, less than 21% of the global hydrogen production, right? So it's mainly happening through steam methane reforming, 49%, and uh, about 30% happening from um, oil reforming. So uh, when we look at it, well, of course, um, uh, steam methane reforming is a, is a better way of doing it than oil reforming. It's cheaper as well. And so we'll focus mainly on steam methane reforming. And uh, the process remains the same. So we'll discuss steam methane reforming, and then we'll talk about some other options available for uh, for uh, producing hydrogen, apart from steam methane reforming, uh, starting from a fossil fuel, right? And lastly, we will also touch upon water electrolysis to talk about a process which can make use of renewable energy to again create uh, hydrogen. Now, uh, when we talk about steam methane reforming or uh, reforming of natural gas, which is mainly methane, uh, it's a very mature technology. It's used currently in uh, in the industry, uh, mainly in refineries, uh, because they need a lot of hydrogen in there. And um, it's, it's used for producing hydrogen, which is basically called gray hydrogen, as per the color 
pallet associated with uh, different hydrogen production processes depending on their carbon footprint right or depending on the source of hydrogen basically now uh, as i said uh, steam methane reforming is uh, steam methane reforming or smr for short is uh, is a very mature technology it's the most dominant pathway as we see from uh, from this uh, uh, pie chart here and uh, so let's try to understand a little bit uh, on how this works right so what you do in steam methane reforming is that we make use of a methane source typically natural gas uh, which reacts with high temperature steam okay uh, somewhere in the 700 to 1000 celsius range under relatively high pressure, 3 to 25 bar, uh, and you need a catalyst uh, when this reaction is going on. And the purpose of this uh, is, is simply to reform methane to produce hydrogen, right? And uh, what you get is not just hydrogen, because there's uh, there's carbon in methane, so you get hydrogen, but you also get some amount of carbon monoxide, okay? And very small amount of carbon dioxide. So uh, when we look at the reaction itself, this is the main reaction that's happening. You're, uh, this is methane, which is coming from natural gas. Okay, Natural gas is usually 80% uh, uh, methane. So methane from natural gas reacts with uh, steam, right? Uh, H2O uh, at a relative, at, I would say, yeah, uh, intermediate temperatures and pressures and in presence of a catalyst to give us three moles of uh, Hydrogen plus one mole of carbon monoxide. So one mole of uh, methane is giving you three moles of uh, hydrogen. Okay. Now we don't stop here, of course. Uh, now uh, for making this reaction happen, for the steam methane reforming, um, uh, we had to provide some uh, energy. It's an endothermic reaction. So um, we ended up with uh, hydrogen plus CO. So what we need to do is now next, uh, well, we take the CO and then uh, uh, again make it uh, react with steam again uh, in. In another, in another reaction, which is uh, commonly called as the water gas shift reaction, uh, water is H2O and gas being the CO there. And in the water gas shift reaction, we produce more hydrogen. And this also happens in presence of a catalyst. So both reactions that we are talking about here, steam methane reforming reactions right here, and the water gas shift reaction, both of these happen in presence of a catalyst and both happens in presence of steam. So first is methane reacting with steam, and then second is the CO that you produce, it reacts with steam to produce CO2 and some more hydrogen. So in total, for one mole of fuel, you get four moles of hydrogen, one, three moles from the methane reforming and one mole from the water gas shaft reaction. So it's, it's a very good way of producing hydrogen. Uh, and it's uh, as, as we discussed, it's the most uh, mature, it's a very mature technology, it's the most dominant way. And uh, although I'm, I'm I'm sort of making use of um, methane here to show how this entire process works, but you can do exactly the same thing with other fuels as well. So you can use um, ethanol, propane, gasoline, and others. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, natural gas is mainly used, and natural gas, although it's, we said it's mainly methane, but it also contains ethane, right? So C two H six and propane C three H eight and others. And so the process is exactly or uh, or it's very similar to what we have uh, defined here. OK, so this is steam methane reforming. Uh, key point is it's endothermic. Uh, it requires a catalyst, right? And it is it's uh, uh, it uh, produces some CO2, of course, but this CO2 can be captured. Uh, uh, and uh, if you capture the CO2 from uh, steam methane reforming process, then the hydrogen uh, that you obtain is called blue hydrogen. If you do not do carbon capture, then it's called gray hydrogen, okay? Now, moving on, steam methane reforming, although it's a very mature technology, it's the most dominant way of producing hydrogen. It is not the only way, right? Uh, of course, we want to come up with other ways which uh, reduce the energy requirement, make it cheaper to produce hydrogen. So the two other, uh, let's say, options that are being explored uh, uh, on a research basis uh, globally are basically, uh, partial oxidation and autothermal reforming. There are many, many other options uh, that are being explored currently, but let's let's uh, let's uh, limit to these two. When we talk about partial oxidation, it's essentially instead of reacting with steam, what you do is uh, you make the methane or any other hydrocarbons that you have in the natural gas. They you want uh, you make them react with oxygen. So basically, what you're doing is uh, some sort of a combustion reaction, but incomplete combustion. Uh, a key difference here is that. Um, Normally, when you talk about combustion, we do combustion in air, right? Uh, so air is a mixture of uh, oxygen plus uh, nitrogen. So 
for every mole of oxygen, you have 3.76 moles of nitrogen in the air, right? But when we talk about partial oxidation, uh, it is just the oxygen that you uh, that the methane reacts with. So we just supply oxygen to methane, and we uh, and uh, we supply less oxygen than what's needed, right? Stoichiometric amount basically means the amount you need for complete combustion, but we provide less than that. We provide less oxygen than that's needed for complete combustion. And uh, the idea is simply because we don't want complete combustion to happen. We only want uh, this reaction, which is an exothermic reaction, right? It produces heat. We want this reaction to uh, partially oxidize the hydrocarbons that we have, methane, for example, and it produces mainly hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Now, this carbon monoxide, again, you take it, uh, it uh, you make it go to the uh, undergo the water gas shift reaction, okay, just like we explained in the, in the previous slide. So carbon monoxide plus steam gives us uh, CO2 plus uh, hydrogen, right? So you get uh, more hydrogen uh, from the next step, but overall, uh, this is another uh, way of producing hydrogen. It produces less hydrogen per unit of fuel because here we get a total of three moles of hydrogen for one mole of uh, methane as compared to four moles of hydrogen in the previous scenario for steam methane reforming. But um, this is something that does not require a catalyst, right? And it produces, uh, and you don't even have to supply heat. It's not an exo, uh, it's not an endothermic reaction. So it's it's um, it's an interesting reaction. We uh, The economics still do not favor it, which is why steam methane reforming is the most dominant. Uh, so of course, there are some issues that need to be resolved and uh, to make it more economic, but this is another promising way of producing hydrogen. Now, the last uh, um, way that we want to discuss here, uh, that is another promising way, is autothermal reforming. Now, autothermal reforming is sort of a combination of steam methane reforming and partial oxidation. That is, it's a combination of the previous two uh, uh, methods that we described. Now, what happens is that in, in autothermal reforming, uh, methane is going to react with uh, oxygen uh, in, in partial oxidation process, which is an exothermic process. So, some part of methane reacts with oxygen and produces uh, hydrogen and CO. And uh, the remaining part of methane uh, reacts with steam, right? Which is an endothermic process. So what you have here is one, one uh, reaction of methane producing heat, another reaction of methane consuming heat. So what we have is a, uh, is a reaction which is uh, thermally neutral, right? Or a reaction where you don't need any external source, nor do you have to reject heat. So this is, uh, uh, almost like a constant temperature process, and um, it uh, it produces less uh, hydrogen, slightly less hydrogen as compared to steam methane reforming, but it produces more hydrogen as compared to partial oxidation. It's sort of a hybrid uh, uh, process, right? Between partial uh, hybrid of partial oxidation and steam methane reforming. Uh, the advantage being that yeah, you don't need an external source, and you're increasing the amount of hydrogen produced as compared to partial oxidation. Okay. So in terms of uh, the hydrogen production, uh, right? So steam methane reforming produces the most amount of hydrogen per unit of fuel. Next is autothermal reforming. And last is uh, partial oxidation, okay? Uh, the advantage with partial oxidation, you don't need a catalyst. It's an exothermic process. So you don't need any um, uh, 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 energy supply. You don't need any heat supply, okay? Autothermal is a compromise. And steam methane reforming well requires catalyst, requires uh, also the uh, external energy source. Okay, uh, so now the only challenge that makes uh, these partial oxidation and autothermal auto reforming ATR uh, less economically favorable is that they rely on uh, partial oxidation, right? And uh, partial oxidation needs pure oxygen. Okay, so. Uh, if you need pure oxygen, it means that you need to employ air separation units, uh, ASU as they are commonly called, to take in air, which is a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen, as we discussed, and separate and separate oxygen from it. And this oxygen then goes into the oxidation process. So you, uh, this air separation unit would sort of separate um, oxygen and nitrogen primarily by cooling them down to uh, 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 below their boiling points. So it's, um, it's it's an energy intensive process that requires a lot of energy, right? So yes, we are saving energy in, in terms of not providing the uh, thermal energy needed uh, or uh, for uh, making the process happen, like we need for steam methane reforming, but well, uh, we need uh, air suppression unit, which is another energy sink. So 
Overall, um, steam ether informing is the uh, process which has the highest thermal efficiency uh, and the highest uh, 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 is, is the most dominant method, but these two are promising and they're still under current research. Okay. Now, lastly, if you want to produce methane, not from a fossil fuel, but from renewable energy completely, then uh, we can make use of uh, water electrolysis to make it happen. Now, water electrolysis simply uh, is an electrolyzer which uh, takes an incoming water stream and it's pushed that into hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, we can then still sell this hydrogen, uh, oxygen as well, right? On on top of the hydrogen that you get up uh, get from here. Now, uh, electroly uh, electrolysis process, of course, makes use of uh, a lot of electrical energy for making it happen, and it's in principle it's just. Uh, a reverse process of what happens in a fuel cell, right? In a fuel cell, you provide hydrogen, takes oxygen from the air, and then it produces electricity. Here, it's the opposite. You, um, uh, elect uh, sorry, fuel cell produces electricity and also some amount of water, right? So here is the opposite. You provide water, uh, and uh, the input is water, and the output is uh, uh, hydrogen. Okay, uh, it's it's an interesting process. It uh, the electrical energy that you need for water electrolysis can come from renewables, which will make it, uh, you know, uh, some having less carbon footprint than the other options. Uh, but it's 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 pretty costly for now, right? Uh, if you want to look at the numbers involved, if you, uh, for uh, for doing electrolysis versus uh, steam methane reforming for hydrogen production, you can look through this uh, G hydrogen calculator. Uh, for using the uh, the combined cycle uh, power plant that's uh, and used in Korea. So you, this model is available in the list. So you can just click that link, uh, select this model, do a combined cycle power plant, maybe uh, do two into one configuration, uh, two, uh, two gas turbines for one steam turbine, and then um, see for yourself how much uh, amount of water is needed and how much amount of electrical energy is needed for producing the hydrogen using water electrolysis versus how much amount of methane and how much amount of uh, water again is needed for producing hydrogen using steam methane reform, right? So it's something uh, interesting to look at. Okay, well, that will end the class. We'll continue uh, with the numerical problems in the class tomorrow.